Now, if I had to say one thing that's improved me as a photographer more than anything else, it's printing. I absolutely love it. But it hasn't always been the case because over the years, I've wasted a ton of time and money trying to get it right. A big part of the problem was that even though I did everything I'd been told, when I thought my display was calibrated correctly, it wasn't. So in this video, we're going to go through everything that you need to do to fix that so that your display is calibrated correctly. The brightness level, the colours and all the settings. Now, even though I'm going to be calibrating my BenQ monitor using BenQ software, the settings you see me use do translate into other calibration software if that's what you're using, along with a different brand of monitor and also a different calibration device. The monitor I use day to day and love is my BenQ SW321C, a 32 inch 4K display which amongst other very useful bells and whistles has a matte display, meaning little to no reflections, so I don't find the need to use the included lens hood. Best of all though, it's hardware calibrated as opposed to software calibrated, basically meaning the display will be more accurate in terms of color and brightness. The calibration device I'll be using is the X-Rite i1 Pro Plus, which is now called the Calibrite Color Checker Display Pro Plus. The calibration software I'll be using is Palette Master Element, which is specifically for BenQ monitors. But like I said, the settings will translate into other calibration software. The last thing to mention is before you do any calibration whatsoever, make sure that your monitor has been on for at least a few minutes. And when you plug in your calibration device, give that a few minutes too to allow everything to settle and to stabilize. Right, let's get on with it. Okay, so when we first open Palette Master Element, this is what we see. If you had more than one monitor connected, you'd see that in the drop down, but I just have the one which is my BenQ SW321C. The next box down shows the calibration device we're using. You can see my i1 Display Pro Plus is here, and next to it is a green tick, which shows that it's been recognized and is connected, so no problems there. If you don't see the calibration device, then you can click on the down arrow to choose it from the list available. And when you do, it should connect. If it doesn't connect, just click on the check sensor button. In the past, I did have problems with this in older versions of Palette Master Element, and that was mainly when I didn't connect the device directly to the computer and instead connected it through a USB hub. That doesn't seem to be a problem now, but it's just worth bearing in mind in case you do experience connection issues. Lastly, we can choose between basic and advanced. And of course, we're going to choose advanced. This will give us much more control and produce a much more accurate result, which will be more suited to what we do. And it's still a very simple process. Then we click on start. On the next screen, over on the left, we can see a summary of everything so far. The monitor we're calibrating, the calibration device, the mode we're using, which is of course advanced, and then down at the bottom, we can see the versions of the software and device we're using. In this case, at the time of recording, I'm using version 1.3.17.0 of Palette Master Element. We then have a choice of profiling and validation. We're going to choose profiling, but we will be covering validation in a little while too, as that is a very useful part of the process. For now though, we choose profiling and then click on next. So this is where we get to fine tune our display and how bright it is and how the colors will look. At the top, there are a number of presets depending on what kind of work you're doing, photography, video, web design, and in a professional environment and where color is critical, you would use different settings to suit each. These presets don't really take into account our own environment, so we'll not use one of those. However, watch what happens when we do start changing the default settings as this will then change to say custom. Then we move down to where it says white point. Now by default, this is set to D65, which for argument's sake and without getting sucked into the technicalities is 6,500 Kelvin. Now this is the industry standard white point and is generally the white point that modern devices such as TVs, tablet devices, phones and monitors are all set to. If you're only ever sending images to a lab to be printed, then you won't go wrong using this as your white point. However, 
If you're doing your own printing, you'll probably want a slightly warmer white point as this will give you a noticeably better screen to print match. A common white point used in labs and studios is slightly warmer, around 5,800 Kelvin. Now, if you're watching this particular video, then you probably own a BenQ monitor. And the great thing here is that we can actually store up to three different calibrations. So you could do one at the industry standard of D65 for times when you're sending to a lab, one at 5,800 Kelvin for when you're doing your own printing, and then there's a spare one for general day-to-day -day use or video editing or whatever. Next, we have the RGB primaries, which is all to do with the color range or gamut you want your BenQ monitor to display. By default, it shows here as Adobe RGB, and we can see within this triangle here, set down by these three points, what range of colors that includes. We can choose different RGB primaries too, such as sRGB, and you can see now, because we know that sRGB is a smaller color space, how that has made the triangle smaller to contain the colors that are available within sRGB. Now the BenQ monitors, and I'm specifically talking about the SW range, have a much bigger color space available. So that is why you would consider using panel native. We can see that the triangle has now disappeared, indicating that way more colors are available and will be displayed. The human eye probably won't see any difference in a lot of those colors, but the fact is they are there, so don't restrict what's available. Now, by the way, when we are using panel native, this doesn't mean that when we're working in, say, Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One and editing images that are Adobe RGB or ProPhoto RGB or sRGB, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna be displayed correctly. The software is clever enough to know exactly how they should look. Next, we have luminance, and I would say this is the most important part of all, and what can and does cause most problems when people say their images are too dark. Really, what we should be saying is, why does my display make my images look brighter than they really are? Because 99% of the times that your prints come out dark, it's because your monitor isn't calibrated correctly, and this is most likely down to using the wrong luminance value. Generally, if you work in a bright environment, you would have a high luminance value. And if you work in a darker, more subdued environment, you would have a lower luminance value. Now, my office where I do all my editing is more towards the subdued, lower ambient light. I have gray walls and blackout blinds. I have daylight balanced bulbs, but it's not particularly bright and it's not particularly dark. Now, you'll often hear it said that a range of between 80 and 120 candela is right. However, I have tried and tested so much between those ranges and yet still my images came out looking dark. So after quite a bit of testing and failing, the sweet spot for me is actually 60 candela. That for me produces fantastic results with my prints matching my display. Now this device is able to measure the ambient light where you are, but the Palette Master Element software currently doesn't have the option to use that. That said though, when I have used that in other calibration software, for me, it was still producing dark images, so I had to go through a bit of trial and error to get where I know that 60 candela is right for me. So just be prepared for a bit of that. You might have to try a few different luminance values, a few different calibrations before you actually get it exactly how you want it. Next, we have gamma, and I'll leave this at 2.2, which is ideal for still imaging work like we're doing, but you probably would choose something different like, say, 2.4 or whatever if you were calibrating for video work. The last choice to make on this screen is the black point, and we have two choices. By default, it's set to absolute zero, and I'm going to suggest that if you're printing images, that you don't use this. Absolute zero is telling your display to use the deepest, darkest blacks possible. However, this means the shadow areas in your images are gonna be less accurate in terms of color. Absolute zero would mean very strong contrast, but if you're wanting to print images, you would want to reduce contrast, so that your monitor will be a better match for paper. A good figure to use is around 0.5 nits. Once you're finished, you could then click Save Settings, give these settings a name, and then be able to use them with one click instead of making the changes again by just choosing it from the drop-down menu. Okay, when we're done, click Next. Now, like I mentioned before, the great thing about the BenQ monitors is that we can create up to three calibrations and just change between them using the puck that comes with the monitor or by using the buttons on the monitor itself. 
So here we can choose which of the three available calibrations we want this one to be stored under for easy and quick access. Here I'll choose Calibration 2 because I already have Calibration 1 assigned with settings using the D65 as the white point. Then we can choose a name of the profile that will be created. By default, a name is created that includes all the settings we've applied, but you could call it something a bit more user-friendly if you wanted to. Then we have Profile Version, Version 2 or Version 4. Now you could use the most recent version, which is Version 4, and there'll be arguments for that. However, I've used it and have had several failures and crashes in the past, so I tend to stick with version 2, and I've never had any problems, and I'm really happy with the results that I get. However, if things do change in the future, I'll make sure to update this video. Then we have patch size, and we'll go for large. And this means the device will measure and correct more patches. It will take longer, but the final result is much more accurate. So when you're happy with that, click on Start Measurement. The software then instructs you to rotate the cover on the i1 display to reveal the lens that goes against the screen. It's worth saying here that you'll notice on the i1 it has a rubber around the lens and this goes against the screen causing a seal so that no outside ambient light gets between it and the screen and affects the measurement process. This means you don't have to calibrate at the times when you work or necessarily create several calibrations for working at different times of day. It's much easier and creates a far better and more consistent workflow if you control the light in the room using blinds and lighting so that it is as consistent as possible during the day, evening and night. OK, so now click on continue and place the device on the screen. If you angle the display back a little, the device will stay in place much better and create that seal. And once you've done that, click on continue and leave it to it. You'll see the screen flashing for a while as the device takes measurements, and this can take up to maybe 30 minutes, but typically a lot less, maybe around about 10. So now that the measurement process is finished, we can see some of the results. Our target luminance value was 60, and we achieved 58.847, which is fantastic. The target temperature, we went for 5,800 Kelvin, and we've achieved 5,823, which again is a great result and definitely close enough. Now the next step is that we're going to validate the calibration. Now there is an argument that says why would you do the validation using the exact same equipment that you did the initial calibration with because if there were errors then they're only going to be repeated. However there's no harm in it and if there were any errors or not they're going to show up in the final report that's generated anyway. Here again we can confirm where the preset is being saved, the name and the profile version. There's also this section at the bottom for average and maximum and the sign next to it which means delta E. Simply put, this is a measurement of how much a displayed colour can differ from its input colour. A lower delta E number means better colour accuracy. Anything from 5 and below is very good, but 2 and below is excellent and shows that the colour of the monitor is incredibly accurate. So for average we'll put 2 and the maximum we'll put as 5. Then we'll hit Validate Calibration. Again, Palette Master Element tells us to uncover the lens on the measurement device and we'll then click on Continue. We place the device in the correct place and again click Continue. The validation process doesn't take as long as the initial measurement. Once finished, this is the report we see. And first of all, fantastic news. The calibration and the validation has passed, meaning everything is good. Let's now look through some of the information. We can see that the black point is measured as 0.44 nits and we went for 0.5, so again, incredibly accurate. But looking at where it says test, the average delta E and the maximum delta E, we set 2 as the average and maximum as 5 and we've actually measured 1.23 on the average with a maximum of 3.31. This is excellent, showing that our monitor is displaying very accurate colour. 
Now it's good practice to export the report and keep them safe. Doing this generates a HTML file so you'll view the results in your web browser and the reason this is a good thing to do is because over time you can keep an eye on how your monitor is doing from calibration to calibration. Everything has a lifespan and displays are no different so you can see if the delta E number is changing. If it keeps getting higher then you know the display is maybe reaching its end of life but if it's getting lower then brilliant colors are getting even more accurate. But that's it. Click finish. That closes down Palette Master Elements and you can get to work or maybe do some more calibrations with different settings for different requirements and save them if you have any more of the three presets available. So there you go. That's all you need to do to just get up and running fast and get your display calibrated correctly so that you get the very best out of it and also get the very best possible results when it comes to printing. And this is all forming part of my upcoming printing course where I go through this in more detail, including printers, what papers to use, sending stuff to a lab and all that kind of stuff. But more about that later on. But for now, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, click on that subscribe button. That's just a great free way that you can support this channel. But for now, that's me. I'm done. I'll see you in the next video.